Good afternoon, everybody. We have a lot to get through in this session, three brilliant talks, so we're going to start bang on time. Um, so my name is Sarah Never. I'm a member of the Young Statisticians section. You may recognise us from our uh, red t-shirts around the conference. And today's session is a very special session, RSS Prize winners um, from the Statistical Excellence Award for Early Career Writing uh, 2019. And the, the YSS uh, organised this a specific competition and award alongside Significance Magazine. So firstly, I'd like to invite up uh, Brian Tarrant from Significance Magazine to just say a few words about this, this award before we have um, our finalists and our winner. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody, for coming along. Uh, this is a very special uh, session for us, and uh, in fact, the writing competition is one of the, the, my favourite parts of the job. So we run it every year. It's open to uh, all early career statisticians, and we get entries from all over the world, people writing articles on uh, whatever takes their interest. Um, the winner obviously gets published in Significance magazine and the, the write up will be featured on our website. So I'm delighted that we have all three finalists here. Uh, we have uh, uh, Luke, uh, Luke Shaw, who's our, our, our winning uh, article. Uh, he, he wrote that with his brother Liam, and that's going to appear in our October issue. Uh, we also have Max Einer from uh, the University of Lausanne. Uh, who's uh, written a piece about uh, political polarisation in Switzerland, that's right. Okay. Good, remember the right country. And we also have uh, Marco and uh, Andrade. Marco Andrade from uh, the Auto uh, National Autonomous University of Mexico. And Marco has done a piece about uh, sort of training a uh, machine uh, learning algorithm to look at financial data. Uh, so it's great to have them all here. Uh, I hope you enjoy the presentations and that you look forward to seeing them published in significance in various forms over the coming months. And if you are a young statistician, early career statistician, you are interested in what you hear and you'd like to enter our competition next year, uh, that uh, kicks off in February 2020. And if you're not an early career statistician, but you know plenty of early career statisticians, we would encourage you to uh, promote it far and wide because it's lovely to see uh, so many people and so many uh, original ideas come through. So, I'll hand back to Sarah, thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. That's certainly enough from us. So without any further ado, I would like to invite up Luke Shaw from the Office of National Statistics, speaking about his winning entry, which is called The Flying Bomb and the Actuary. Luke. Thank you very much. Uh, firstly, just to say that thank you to Significance and for winning this award. This wasn't just me, I did do this with my brother, so all these people live tweeting, he's there as well, so Liam P. Shaw is his handle, um, <laughs> otherwise he's going to kill me. So unfortunately he couldn't be with him with us today. So without that, I'm going to set the scene a little bit, and so imagine that it's the summer of 1944, and you're in central London, it's a dark starry night, and you hear this sound. So the first V1 bomb, and these are flying bombs, fell on the 13th of June in direct retaliation to D-Day. So D-Day landings happened, and then after this, the Germans launched um, these V1 bombs. So they're, they're basically flying bombs. They're planes without anyone in, without anyone steering. I basically, I think of them like those little toys that you wind up and then you let go and they go for a certain amount of time. What was of great importance at the time was, is this, were they falling at random, or was there any kind of targeted bombing or clustering going on? People seem to notice that there was, you know, one street in London would get hit three times, but then two streets over there was nothing. So this is what our talk, um, my talk without my brother here, is about today, and it's about looking at were they falling at random, and if so, like what can we actually say about the data? So uh, in 1946, an actuary was tasked with this with this problem. Basically, how do you how do you determine if something's random or not? Um, so what Clark did was it was decided appropriately for the RSS conference to apply a statistical test. And this is a famous textbook example of an application of the Poisson distribution. I've been told to make this um, a completely kind of stats uh, novice level. There's, I'm not assuming any technical knowledge, so I'm going to Start off, right, what is the Poisson distribution? So the Poisson distribution is really useful when thinking about random independent events, but you can talk about them in some kind of useful way, talk about probability of different things happening. So the example that I like is if you're in a queue for self-checkout aisle and 
there's in the, you know, each time of checkouts becoming free, so you can go to one as an independent event, and we know, say, it happens 30 seconds on average, so that's our break parameter, that's the key thing for a custom distribution, is the rate at which something happens on average. And what the pricing distribution helps you to do is give you some measurable information, say you're fifth in the queue, what probability that you might get to a checkout in under two minutes, or something like that. So it seems like they're totally random, each, in, each event is independent of each other, but the pricing distribution helps with that. And the second thing is the chi squared test, and this is, put simply, is a way of comparing two different columns to look if they came from the same population. So for two different things, are they actually, you know, is there any difference between them when you do any kind of measuring? Now that's out of the way. This, this is what Clark did, is actually, so he had, right over here, this is, think of these as individual bombs falling over London. And so what he has is he has this map, and then it's very much thinking of, he drew a grid over it, and then counted up in each individual square how many bombs fell. And what this reminds me of is, um, I think it was when I was about 13 in, in science classes. You go outside with a grid and you get to, you know, just throw it over and start counting the bits of grass and obviously the most fun bit is seeing how far you can fling the thing and then go over um, And that's what Clark's doing but with, with a map. Think of it like, like a grid, right? And then what you can then do is then count up, make a frequency table of how many bombs, how many, yeah, in each square how many there were and each one counts as one, so hopefully that makes sense. And then you can utilize the Poisson distribution and the chi squared test to think about whether they're forming a random or not. So this is his very pretty table that he came up with and that was then published. So we can see from the Poisson distribution what you'd expect if you had our known rate parameter. So he knew that he had 576 bombs within this shape. And then actually what he counted up on the right. And just from an eyeball test, this looks pretty, like they look pretty similar. Um, and the chi squared test uh, so ended up with a p-value of 0.88. I'm not going to talk too much about p-values in, in particular, but basically there's no reason to reject the idea that these bombs are falling in random. And so that's what Clark published. That, that was the answer. And, you know, there's no reason to think that these bombs aren't forming at random. But you can't go backwards. So you can't go from this table back to the raw data to look at it. And Clark, for very sensible reasons, didn't published the underlying data because it was sensitive at the time, right, where specific bombs were falling over London. And that's where this comes in. So this is the part where I hold my hand up and say, this was my brother definitely leading on this work. The, um, the London County Council republished all their bomb maps. Um, so these are, these are beautiful, so I'll, I'll show you an example. So this is what it looks like. This is an A3 page. And you see here, this is a specific bomb location. So this is hand drawn on, and the coloring is how significant the, um, the damage to the certain buildings. So if you see something that's black, that means the building was totally wiped out. And what my brother has done is manually gone through every page, through every single bomb, and put it online. So, so you can see this if you want. This is open, um, open source. We have our data available. One of the Weird and wonderful things was I happened to be in London when he linked it to me, and I was on my phone, and wow, this is cool, and I looked on Google Maps, and then I went off and did something else. And then when I was walking around and looking at maps to see where I was, the bombs were overlaid onto the map. So that's a really cool <laughs> cool thing if you, if you happen to be in London, have this link, just you can layer it over um, and go from there. So each, each black mark is a V1 bomb, and then you see that green point over there, we'll come back to that in a bit. And this is just an example of our three different three different things for the same thing. So Lewisham's in South London. You see from this image from the Imperial War Museum, the circles are where specific bombs fell, and you can see just the desolation around it, so they've been taken shortly after um, the bombs. And then this is the, the kind of blown up image of, in the bomb damage map, so you see this big total white power matches there, and then this is it in our Google Maps there, the same thing. So, now we could recreate this analysis that Clark did over 70 years ago. Um, one thing to say is that he doesn't specify what area of London he's looking at, so we had to guess. Um, things that we can use to guess, so for example, he says it's in South London, so that's a very controversial topic of what South London for people that live in London. Uh, but from our data, we knew, this, we knew the size, we knew it was in South London, 
make a pretty good guess that it's going to be along British national grid lines. Um, so we did that. And also you can see that the data we have, the limitations of the space that we know about means that uh, this was a pretty good guess. And so with our 576 squares, we don't get quite as many bombs um, that, that Clark did, so we, we might not have exactly the same area. But we end up with the same result, the same idea that there's no reason to expect that they're not forming a random. Um, so that was great. We'd recreated the analysis, wonderful. But there's, it still feels slightly that we've, we've got data that we're not using here. And so we thought, if, if we're coming at this problem fresh, what would we do if we were trying to answer the same problem? And so the first point was, how do we make sure we can use all the data? How do we try and use all the data we've got? And this involved creating a boundary for our known data. So for example, if we, if we use Clark's method with the grid, and we count it here, we'd say that there were no bombs falling. But that's not technically true, because we just don't know the information, right? We don't know what's there. Um, the way that this was the Lundy County Council lines, ish. So there's no easy shape file that we could just take from online to say, this is what the London County Council looked like in 1946, and so that's all the information we had. And so the solution was to create a hull. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but basically, there are some very nice functions online that people have to give it a set of points and it does a kind of match the dots around the top. Uh, you can either have it be convex or concave, and we went for some kind of Goldilocks thing in the middle because that's what seems to be best. And this was the method we used. So this is a kind of bootstrapping. So we start in the same place as Clark. We have, we have our known bombs on the map, and then we randomly pick a point within, uh, within our hull and pick a point do a circle of the same size as the squares, and then use that to count up in the table. And the, one of the really nice things about this is we can just keep simulating if we want. We just do this more times. We're not limited by the 576 squares. We can just simulate as much as we want. And bootstrapping simply says that that's kind of fine. Uh, and what, what happened when we did this? So if we, we, yeah, we I apologize to statisticians for my explanation of that. Uh, <laughs> And then we can perform the randomness test on this table much in the same way as if we're using the Poisson distribution. Now, to, sorry, just to say quickly that from, from this result, uh, we, actually, we actually don't get the same analysis that the bombs are falling at random. So just quickly, looking, looking at this bit of data, the, the reason for this, and, and we, can check, we can check this, is that over this, it, is, it does seem that it's falling at random. But actually, there are fewer bombs falling over North London, so the test doesn't hold up in the same way. And that, that matches with the intuition, because the bombs were coming from, from France and uh, from up to the kind of, as far as London's concerned, from the south and the southeast. So it kind of matches the intuition that they were falling shorter, and more likely to fall short than they were long, if that makes sense. Uh, and then, taking seemingly a complete left turn, we come to this novel called Gravity's Rainbow, which has this example in. And it has this example of using randomness in the Poisson distribution for bombs falling in London. And we can trace the history of this. So Clark published his textbook example in 1946, and then there was someone called Professor Fowler at Cornell University, who we know really likes this example, uh, in 1950. And then Thomas Pynchon, who wrote this book, took, uh, well, we're pretty sure he took Professor Fowler's course at Cornell in 1954, and then he published this in 1973. And you say well, the, the rockets are distributed about London just as Poisson's equation in the textbook predicts. Um, but there's one thing that's slightly different that you might remember from that second image that we had uh, compared to this front cover, and that's that he's talking about a different bomb. So this is the V2 rocket, and so what the V2 was, this is a, a ballistic missile, so uh, first launched in September 1944, and it's, yeah, it was supersonic, instead of, instead of your wind-up toy that it goes for a certain time and then drops. This is really like, this is a rocket. This thing is fired up from the ground and then, um, yeah, falls like that. And when we can actually perform, so we have the data for V2s as well, and we can perform the same test and we get over that, that region that they seem to be falling at random, so there's no kind of precision going on there as well. Um, but yeah, also to be aware that um, Pynchon knew that, probably almost certainly knew that he's talking about the wrong bomb in his example, but it just it makes the novel work better, so that makes sense. And then, so I just wanted to kind of bring this back to that first night and thinking about, you know, it's all very exciting talking about the data we've got and this seemingly lovely kind of starry example. That's actually, 
That is the square of the hand. You can't see here, but we've got this, this red rectangle. Um, that is our bomb data that we've, we've collected, that it's free to use. And just thinking about this specific point. So this was, in fact, the first bomb that fell. So it fell in Mile End. Six people died, and over 200 were made homeless through the fact that this bomb blew up their houses, right? Um, it can be thought of as very, you know, it, I, I'm not sure if you noticed in this, it's very exciting thinking about this data, it's lots of fun. Um, but actually, we're, we are talking about hundreds of thousands of civilian deaths from the court, you know, from these tactics. And also, there wasn't any kind of specific, you know, um, British, you know, our British statisticians were involved in much the same way in kind of the bombing sort of Dresden and Hamburg. And that kind of thing is worth being aware of that each data point we have here is a bomb that's on, that's being, you know, over London and on civilians. And then just finally, um, to acknowledge, so there we are again, my brother, he definitely can't say I didn't do anything. Uh, thanks, <laughs> thanks a lot to Lawrence and Jeremy and John, and to Quentin and Claire, and finally to Philip Shaw, uh, our grandfather, who's, who's still with us, who remembers V1 bombs falling over London. Thank you very much. I would like to begin uh, by telling you the origin of the story about a tiny bug, which is the topic of the article I wrote for the Significance Writing Competition. Um, last April, I was on holidays at, at home, and I was very sad because uh, my crush thinks that I am a nice guy, but just that, it's really a very <laughs> strong situation. Uh, uh, I was uh, anxious and very stressed, and I couldn't stop thinking about it. But suddenly, uh, a saying came to my mind, uh, don't worry, get busy. Not sure if the saying was applied to the right context, but I, I started working on the computation. But uh, what a story to write. Well, I started remembering a situation when I was in my classroom after a violation inference class, and two friends were talking about uh, some artificial intelligence concept, uh, such as um, improving human abilities and simulating <coughs> complex brain processes like feeling fear or, or love and the consciousness. And I was thinking about it. And suddenly I became aware of my awareness and a question was raised uh, regarding my current emotional state. Um, to the kind of situations where adversity starts as part of creativity uh, be simulated using technology? Uh, well, we can find optimist researchers who think that um, it could happen in decades. So others like Dr. Ronnie Brooks from MIT estimate hundreds of years. No one can be completely sure about this. However, uh, one thing is true right now, uh, AI is a very powerful tool that uh, little by little is a more intimate part of our lives than ever. Today we can find AIs uh, capable of, of driving cars, detecting disease, or, or recognizing objects. And I like to think about these AIs and technology in general as, as tools that can be attached to humans to make us uh, better, at least in some way. Uh, I mean, it, it allows us to cross the Atlantic in a few hours or save and analyze thousands of gigabytes of data. And these kinds of, of things are not natural. Uh, we can achieve them because of these tools. In this regard, I thought I will create a book and I will uh, write a story about it. Uh, the purpose is to show that it's becoming increasingly easy to create bots and that there is a logical path uh, to creating them in which the use of data and statistics is the core. When I wrote the story, I tried to do it in a thought-provoking way. Uh, I didn't do it only making a description of the work. Uh, I tried to write a story in a way which the book uh, would have consciousness, uh, which of course now is considered sci-fi, uh, but uh, possibly it could possibly be real in the future. Uh, hopefully the article will be published and you will be able to read it online. Uh, but today I am not here to talk about sci-fi. Uh, I would like to talk about the real deal. And what's that? Uh, the real part is that, that AI can provide us with abilities to do very complex processes or at least speed up time-consuming processes. The other day I saw a Facebook meme which uh, describes AI, uh, what people think it is, what amateur programmers think it is, and what it 
actually is. Uh, so it states that AI is just if statements, and it's funny because this answer to the question what is AI is completely wrong, uh, since there are also else statements. <laughs> <laughs> of, of course, I am joking. Uh, a current approach uh, when we talk about an AI that emulates specialized human thinking or behavior uh, is simple and there are not a lot of if statements. Uh, we write a few lines of code and we call uh, this set of code, for example, a bot. Uh, afterwards, with the bot ready, we give it a bunch of data about some specific subject and then he will start learning from this data and derives its own rules and if you want its own if statements to achieve some specific goal. It's like the idea of raising a child. Uh, do, you don't teach kids a rule for every situation. Instead, they have positive or negative experiences and then uh, they, have, uh, they figure it out on their own. I am calling these uh, experiences data. Now, as an example, I will talk about my bot. It has uh, 355 lines of code. Uh, R code, uh, it's very short. After creating the bot, I gave it a bunch of, bunch of data and now he's capable of identifying the stock chart patterns. Um, his name is Artemis, which is also the name of my cat. <laughs> the bot structure is based on object oriented programming. Uh, from a simple point of view, it means that Artemis has features like name or birthday and abilities like uh, print an article or download, download some data from the internet. Um, and you can have just one Artemis in your computer, but uh, can, you can also make copies of him so you can have a group or an army of these words. Artemis can be downloaded from my GitHub account. Here's a link. You also will find on the same page a short guide to install and start using him. Artemis doesn't have um, a friendly interface to interact with humans yet, uh, but it's it's very easy to talk with him. Uh, for example, uh, we can send messages to him and he will answer back. Uh, to ask his name, we uh, just write this line on the art console, uh, Artemis plus dollar sign plus get name, and he will answer back with his name. Uh, the same applies for asking for his birth. Someone who feels familiar with object or in programming could say that that's not AI, it's, it's, it's just an, an, an object with very simple methods. And that's true, <clears throat> but it's the beginning of this, of, of this bot. And as we'll see at the end, he will be able to uh, perform a very specialized task. Uh, a couple of hours after the build of Artemis, I gave him a new ability. I call it uh, Generate Student Material. It means that uh, someone uh, provides a list of tickers to Artemis. A ticker is an arrangement of characters representing a security. For example, AAL is for the American Airlines Company. Uh, then Artemis browses the Yahoo website to download the related historical prices. Uh, this work is done using an R package uh, called QuantMo. I gave Artemis 503 tickers and he downloaded uh, the price time series for, for all of them from 2007 to his date of birth. Uh, all this data is saved in a feature um, called Study Material. We can think this. Um, we can think about this as the books used by a kid when he goes to a school. It's something similar to, to R for Artemis. A few days later, I added a new ability to Artemis. I call it Learn, and it allows to Artemis to gather examples of charm patterns. Until now, I have taught him two patterns: uh, good wood handle and double bottom. Good wood handle uh, looks like a good profile with the handle on the right, and uh, just like figure A. And in figure B, we can see a double bottom, which looks like a W. The learning ability uh, does the following. It takes a time series representing a chart pattern, for example, uh, a good wood handle, like your A. And then uh, Artemis takes his study material and splits every time series into subsets to determine possible candidates. 
for the parent. Then he compares each candidate with figure A through a similarity measure, uh, for example, the Euclidean distance. And, and here comes an interesting thing, since it's how Artemis get his knowledge. So until now, Artemis has a, a similarity measure for each candidate, which is just a number representing half similar as a candidate to the Kirkwood handle pattern. After that, Artemis uh, sorts the candidates from high to low, then displays a plot. Um, and after that, uh, he asks, does the plot contain a true Kirkwood handle pattern? A human should answer, and in this case, that human was me. All answers I said in uh, Artemis features, which I named knowledge. With the knowledge ready, uh, a new ability is required since the knowledge isn't enough to test how well Artemis has learned the patterns. I named this new ability train. It basically uses uh, two R packages for machine learning, CADET and H2O. I asked Artemis to use five methods. We will see it on the next table. Uh, to train the five methods, uh, Artemis splits his knowledge into two sub two subsets. One of them is used to train in the models and selects the its best parameters. The other subset allows for Artemis uh, testing how good are uh, the results on new data. Here are the performance statistics. Um, considering the accuracy of the third column, uh, neural networks and super vector machines uh, were the best training methods. They got around 0 0.8 and 0 0.9, uh, meaning that for each 10 guessing trials, Artemis failed probably once and twice. Of course, the results <coughs> were not perfect, uh, with the worst results in the sensitivity, uh, but Artemis has another great ability to take advantage uh, of these uh, models. I named uh, this uh, last ability Explore. Artemis uh, just needs a list of figures to start it, then he goes to the Yahoo website and downloads the daily cost prices for each uh, Ticker. Afterwards, he applies uh, his training models to determine the presence of hooks with handle and double bottoms. I am happy with this because Artemis can explore one or 100 uh, tickers, and unlike me, his performance is not affected by the flight amount of work. Um, he never feels tired, disappointed, bored, or sad like humans. He, he is free for, for all of these limitations, and so the job is always done at the same level. To test this last ability, I gave Artemis 100 tickers and he began the exploration. In the best, best case scenario, a manual exploration would take me upwards two hours. For Artemis, it took 19 minutes on a main street laptop. Uh, here are the results uh, of his exploration. The first one is a good with handle, and the two remaining uh, are uh, double bottoms. In conclusion, Artemis has uh, features like name, birthday, study material, knowledge, models, and exploration, and also have abilities uh, like generate study material, learn, train, and explore. That's all, he's Artemis, he can perform identification tasks in a much uh, higher rate than me, and I mean, I am not sure if he is better than me in his accuracy, but time will tell. Indeed, there are, there are a lot of things to be done. For example, we can teach Artemis uh, a lot of, of other channel fighters uh, and improve his knowledge and learning <laughs> ability, uh, trying other similarity measures and other machine learning algorithms. It's even possible to add a bold ability to Artemis. He could be able to buy and sell stocks on his own, and this is not something new. There are books about creating uh, automatic trading systems. As a final aside, um, I confess that Artemis didn't help me too much with my emotional issues. <laughs> but he brought me here, I like the financial world, and I am a raw investor, but um, I am completely sure that these kind of tools are wonderful because, uh, mm, well, at least when working on repetitive stuff, mm, because it can be done by, by bots, and it uh, provides us with free time, and we can spend it on more valuable things like thinking, uh, writing, and telling stories. Thank you. And um, yeah, you're absolutely right. I completely understand that you know the political thing has been going on for a long time now, so hopefully this will be a change. However, I do have to say, while I was preparing this presentation, I started following your politics, and I don't know how you do it. <laughs> it's crazy. It's just a permanent thing. So uh, yeah, this is a little break uh, by Switzerland.
Um, just you know, in order to, to make the connection, though, these are some of the um, references to referendums and popular votes that I've uh, found regarding the UK. But I mean, you don't have to look at these too closely. I'm going to go to uh, the greater picture. So, yeah, these are just BBC talking about referenda, of which here I have a small uh, timeline. So, you will recognize some of these uh, more easily than others. Obviously, the Scottish independence referendum. Brexit, but you also have other referenda, and uh, given that these have been in the media quite a bit recently, I was wondering if there was something one could learn from, from these kind of things. So using popular votes, not for elections, but directly about a certain uh, political topic. And uh, yeah, so th these are some examples. Uh, in the greater picture, though, uh, I want to convey that almost every country uh, has had a national referendum. So this happens at least once per country, uh, these kind of votes. The exceptions, uh, the US, Japan, and India. So typically you have a referendum if you declare independence. But in the US, this is the Declaration of Independence, so they didn't have a referendum for this. Um, overall, though, Switzerland, uh, the country where I come from, accounts for around half of all referendum votes in the world in history. So there's this great book by, by Matt Gortrup uh, from uh, Coventry University which uh, was sadly mistimed because he wrote this great book about referendums and it came out just at the wrong time. Um, but it, it's, it's fascinating. So it talks about all these different kind of votes in the world and that's where I got the figure of 50%. So what I conclude from this, this statistic is we can use Swiss data, because that's the biggest data set, to learn about referendums. So just a, a tiny word about uh, what goes on in Switzerland. So, in Switzerland, you vote four times a year. You get a ballot in the mail. Um, and in that ballot, you have somewhere between one and five issues that you're asked to vote on if you're a Swiss citizen. And uh, this has been going on since a long time, so my data set reaches all the way back to 1900. However, um, as you can see, the enthusiasm for these kind of votes has varied across time. So uh, I have the, the participation rate, so the turnout on these kind of votes on the y-axis. And the number of votes is the bar chart that you see uh, on the x-axis. So clearly we have much more votes now than we used to, but we also participate in them less on average. So uh, this is kind of the story about uh, Swiss votes. And to speak more technically, my data set is 583 uh, votes, popular votes, that are stratified across uh, administrative regions. So in Switzerland, we call them cantons, and uh, also national. OK. so. Now there's a lot of, of votes in this data set, but clearly not all of them are super interesting. So here I've kind of given four examples in this quadrant, this quadrant of, uh, of some votes. So you have votes where people don't participate, they don't really care about it, seemingly, and where the margin, so the, the, let's say the agreement in the population is high. This is something like the private arms industry. Uh, there was a vote to abolish the private arms industry in Switzerland in the 1940s, I think. And uh, I mean, it was overwhelmingly uh, rejected. So, but, but in, in the sense that not many people decided to vote because it seemed like something uh, quite marginal. Then you have uh, votes with a wide margin, so where it's again high agreement but high participation. When people vote to abolish the army in Switzerland, it gets rejected, I mean, with almost 80%. So we have a, a national army, and it's one of the parts of our country that people are most proud of. So. This is something that comes up uh, in a recurring fashion. Now, the, the lower row is the more interesting one. So yeah, OK, votes with low participation, narrow margin. This is somehow a, a catch-all category. There can be lots of stuff in there. But, and here I finally arrive at the type of votes that interest me, is votes with high participation and with narrow margins. So these are ones where a lot of people vote, and the disagreement is quite strong, meaning that the two groups are more or less evenly matched. The EEA accession treaty was something that would have put us in the European Union. It was rejected in, 19, in the 1970s, uh, or 1990s. And um, yeah, this is one of the most, uh, one of the features in the votes that, I, that I'm interested in. Um, this is the only equation, I promise. It's one which gives a score to how polarizing a vote is. So if you have the margin of the participation, these things that I was talking about earlier, you can define it something I call the polarizing score, but it actually comes from this paper. And, and this is, in a sense, how I'm going to capture how polarizing a vote is. And I'm only going to talk about that from now on as, as summarizing uh, the polarization in a certain vote. 
Uh, quick technical note, since the participation, as I showed you earlier, changes across time, I've just made it uh, relative to half decade, but um, this is not super important. Okay, so obviously I don't expect you to know all about the votes that happened in Switzerland. Um, <coughs> these are the top 10 most polarizing votes according to this measure I can find. Um, there's sort of more and less technical ones, some that are more emotional than others, but um, this is just the top 10 list. And the thing that I think we'll, you'll find a, a correspondence to in the rest of European politics is that you have these votes on immigration that happen again more and more uh, in recent years. In recent years, and um, these are the ones that uh, kind of really drive people to go get up and vote, or, or in this case, uh, mail in their voting cards. But yeah, this is uh, the kind of vote that we're talking about uh, in other European countries as well. Okay, uh, now there's also regional differences. I mean, anyone who has looked at a map, or for example, the, the Brexit referendum knows that there's large differences. Here I took a specific example, this uh, federal decriminalization of abortion in 1977, which was rejected, and I um, plotted the, the different regional uh, outcomes for this vote. So you have some uh, areas where, okay, blue, blue uh, accepts the initiative, red rejects, and you have some areas where people are completely unanimous on this. Uh, here in the southeast of the country, people just uh, overall agreed. Uh, same thing in, in the far west side. And then you have also areas where people are, are more or less divided on this. Anyway, that's just to say that there's obviously interesting regional differences uh, that should be taken into consideration. Now, I want to, in a sense, go away from Switzerland and talk a little bit about what this means for other countries as well. And for that, I need a model because I can't just stay inside my data set. So, there's this fascinating branch of statistics, which I'm not going to talk about too much here, and uh, it's called extreme value theory, where you can look at just the highest values in your data set in some sense, and that allows you to uh, predict things and, and talk about how frequent certain events are, etc. So here, if I just count in every five years what the most polarizing vote is, uh, I can use a model from extreme value theory to, to describe these, these values. And Here's the, the result, basically, the one-line result is um, in Switzerland, you have a vote like Brexit every eight years, more or less. So in terms of the polarization that, that we get in our votes in, in, in my country, uh, eight years is about the recurrence period for these kind of votes. And uh, obviously, I mean, the, the comparison is fraught between Switzerland and the UK or any other country, but this is um, to illustrate that these kind of votes just don't go away. Even if you're in a country which has been voting like this <laughs> since 1900, you still have a lot of these kind of polarizing votes, actually very frequently. And um, yeah, so this is the result that I uh, found. Now, the caveats, and I felt so bad that I actually added two slides of caveats because there's a lot of, of things I want to say about this, but uh, there are some votes which are polarizing even if there's high agreement. So, that person who, who proposed to abolish the army, I mean, they became a pariah in the country. So this is clearly something polarizing, even if the outcome of the vote is clear. Uh, the now, you also have polarization, which can decrease participation. If you uh, saw in the list earlier, I had the referendum in Hungary listed. And uh, in that one, the opposition parties just refused to vote, which meant that the, the participation was artificially low. And that isn't reported in my method here. Now, obviously, you have that uh, different types of voters are, are affected differently by polarization, so that's another factor that you need to take into account. But um, there's some more immediate problems with, with the analysis, which is I haven't taken into account the media role at all. And as we know, media is, are, you know, the, the, the role of the media is one that uh, drives political polarization in most countries. I, this is just one example. I don't mean to make a political point about this uh, headline in particular, but. Uh, since I didn't take into account media, I think there's, there's a good part that's missing there. And then also, um, there's a lot of political activity outside vote. So for example, I'm not a Swiss citizen, which means I was not able to vote in any of these uh, recent initiatives, but like 23% of the country, I'm still involved in it, I still care about the outcome. And so there's a lot of political activity that happens outside votes and isn't taken, to, taken into account uh, in this analysis. Okay, uh, thank you for your attention, that's all. Thank <laughs> you.